Well, let's turn together to 1 Timothy. If you're visiting with us, you, uh, with us on the back end of 1 Timothy, we've been making our way through it, and we're beginning chapter 6 this morning. Our focus in the Word of God this morning will be 1 Timothy chapter 6 and those first two verses. 1 Timothy 6, verse 1, and then verse 2. Let's read these together. The word of the living God, this is our God and creator who upholds the whole universe by the word of his power, speaking to us this morning. 1 Timothy 6, verse 1 and 2. Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. May God bless the reading of his word. Lord God, may you now bless the proclamation and the hearing of the proclamation of your word. Father, we praise you for your word, we praise you for your truth, and Lord Jesus, along with your prayer in John 17, we pray that your people would be sanctified uh, by the truth. Father, by your, by your truth this morning, your word is truth, may, uh, may your people be sanctified, may you continue to answer the prayer of your son in bringing about your good plan for your people, that we would be conformed into his image, may Christ be exalted. Uh, Spirit of God, King Jesus said when he was on earth that when you would come, you would glorify him. May he be glorified in the hearts and minds of your people this morning. May he be glorified uh, through the proclamation of his word, through the sound teaching and the sound words of the Lord Jesus Christ that accord with godliness. That your people would be satisfied in him, built up in him, and that we would be so to be uh, those who are uh, in greater obedience to him. King Jesus, you, uh, you, you said that those who love you will keep your commandments. Well, as we uh, expound upon and bring out uh, a portion of your commandments here, may we be uh, fervent and zealous to keep them. Not because we're trying to earn something with you, but because we love you. Because everything that we need has already been found in you. You're, you're enough for us. You're sufficient for us. You have laid down your life uh, for us, your people, once for all, that we would be saved to the uttermost. And that, well, just as we sang earlier, what, what shall we do for all the benefits that the Lord has for me? We'll raise up the cup of salvation and, and, and pay our vows. We'll serve you out of our love for you and out of everything that you've given to us from who you are. May the preaching of your word, and, and as we continue to worship you in this time, may it be used mightily to that end. For your glory and for the joy and sanctification of your people. We pray this, uh, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, if you've ever wondered how you are to relate to or treat all the different individual members in the church, all the different individual members of the body of Christ here in God's household, well, the Apostle has definitely answered that for us here as we've been going through this section in the past several Lord's Days, which goes back to the beginning of chapter 5. Right, someone may ask, well, how, how am I supposed to treat the older men? I'm sitting here in the church and in God's household. How am I to do this? Well, we're, we're taught that very clearly uh, as fathers. Don't rebuke an older man. Encourage him as you would a father. Uh, well, what about the younger men as brothers? What about the older women as mothers? What about the younger women well, as sisters and all purity as the apostle teaches? And we're to do so because in Christ Jesus, we actually are real family. Amen? We're, we're not just, we don't just come in here and, and play a role. We don't just call one another that and this is just role play time. We really are family in Christ. We really are and we are thus to treat one another accordingly. For to all who receive him, Christ Jesus, John, in John 1, 12, who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. 
He gives the right to become a part of his eternal family that loves one another in truth and never fails. Someone says, okay, well, going out from that, what if we have some widows in the church? What if we have some mothers in the church who are destitute and, and helpless in and of themselves? They don't have their husbands there to provide for them anymore. What are we to do with them? Well, Paul told us that. Verses 3 and 4, just to summarize what he teaches from uh, verse 3 to, to verse 16. Honor widows. Take care of them. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, right, if she has family, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. For this is pleasing in the sight of God. So he, he tells us very clearly how, how we are to relate to and to treat our destitute mothers, widows amongst us. Someone says, okay, well, you know, we got these elders here. How, how are we to treat these elders amongst us? How are we to relate to them? Verse 17 to 20, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially uh, those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. And as those who, for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all that the rest may stand and fear. And then for those prospective elders, those who are seeking to become elders, as we are making sure that they have been truly called by God to this task, we are to be loving to them, we are to be encouraging to them, seeing to their embitterment and building up, as the apostle commands us in verse 22. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. Do not be hasty in this, in, in setting apart men to this weighty task, to this noble task and beautiful task in the church. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part of the sins of others. Keep yourselves pure. And then finally, someone comes up in the church, and they ask, well, well what if I'm a bond servant, Pastor? What if I'm a bond servant? How, how am I to act then? How am I to relate to my master now that I'm a Christian? Well, I don't know if in our day and age, and where we live here, in Myrtle Springs, Texas, in the United States of America, I don't know if anyone would ever in my lifetime ask me that question. They might. I mean, that uh, slavery bond servant, that, that may uh, happen again. Who knows? Um, I don't know if anyone would ever ask me that, but we're going to answer it from the Word of God this morning. Amen? We're going to answer it because it's here, and this is what God has, has chosen in the flow of the text that we're going to look at. And brothers and sisters, we're going to see how this command, though... None of us may be bond servants per se today. Uh, it is still very relevant for us here in Myrtle Springs, Texas in the 21st century. We'll have three headings in looking at this this morning. And here in the first one, we're just going to answer this question, what is a bond servant? What, what, what does Paul mean when he says, let all who are under a yoke as a bond servant regard their own master as worthy of all honor? What is a bond servant? Well, in short, a bond servant is a slave. That's what, that's what the word means. A bondservant is a slave. Uh, the Greek word here translated bondservant is the word doulos, or doulos, and that is what the word means. That's just the clear translation of the word. It means slave. Uh, no, no, other translate, no other words to give around that. It's just, it just means slave. Now, in most of our English translations today, you won't find this word the majority of the time, doulos, you're not going to find it the majority of the time translated as slave. Most of the time it's translated as bondservant, uh, as here, or it's translated just as servant. Uh, most of the time you're going to see bondservant or servant. And that is because of the association that the word slave has with what we would call the sinful and dehumanizing institution that we know as slavery that took place here in America. But, you know, the apostle didn't have that practice. What, what we know as slavery that happened here in America, he didn't have that practice uh, per se in his mind when he wrote that word here for those who were slaves in his day. Uh, so church, instead of us veering away from a word just because of an association that it might have, it would be more beneficial for us to interpret the word the way it was originally meant and the way it was used by the Apostle Paul instead of uh, viewing it through our 21st century lenses. Uh, that, and that's just proper hermeneutics. That's just proper way to interpret 
uh, any word, in, in, including the word of God. We don't interpret or translate a word depending on how it makes us or someone else feel because of an association it has. We interpret a word based on what it means. Amen? Amen. So, as I said, Paul doesn't have all of what we know as slavery in, in mind here. And I say that because he's already condemned certain aspects of that kind of slavery earlier in this letter. He's already condemned some of that. Um, what did he already say that the law exposes in contrast to sound doctrine? If you were with us back when we were in chapter 1, he, he mentioned a few things that the law exposes that is contrary to sound doctrine and that which is in, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of our blessed God. Well, in 1 Timothy 10, uh, first, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, he mentioned, one of the things he mentioned was enslavers, man-stealers. That was one of the things he mentioned. Uh, that is those who take someone captive, steal someone, in order to sell them into slavery. Uh, that is the most vivid and extreme breaking of the ninth commandment. It's a sin, it is wicked and immoral to steal anything, but the most vivid display of that is stealing an actual image bearer of God. Stealing a person to sell them. And that's exactly what fueled slavery uh, as we know it here. People were stolen and they were sold into slavery. Beloved, that's explicitly condemned by God in Scripture, explicitly um, Elsewhere in Exodus 21, verse 16, Exodus 21, 16, uh, the law of God declares this. Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him, shall be put to death. You steal someone and you sell them, you're to be put to death in accordance with the law of God. And, and then you have laws as well given for the protection and care of those who are in a proper God-ordained slavery. For example, Exodus 21, verse 20 says, When a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod, and the slave dies under his hand, he shall be avenged. If you, if you strike your slave and you kill them, he shall be avenged for what you have done in taking their life in that way. Exodus 21, verse 26 to 27 as well. When a man strikes the eye of his slave, male or female, and destroys it. So if you strike the eye of your slave and you destroy that eye, it says he shall let the slave go free because of his eye. Also, if he knocks out the tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of his tooth. So, you see, there is no way that Paul in speaking of slavery here, uh, that he's speaking of the practice of slavery as known in America and giving the thumbs up to it. He, he's not. Uh, but at the same time, he's not saying that all slavery is bad either. He's not saying slavery, just the practice in general, is wrong. You don't need to do it, or we wouldn't have the commands that we have. Here, the law of God uh, ordains slavery uh, righteously and not in a way that dehumanizes people. Slavery as ordained and governed by God's righteous law is certainly fine. You see, church, slavery in and of itself is not condemned. But as I said, what is condemned is enslaving. What is condemned is man-stealing and dehumanizing image bearers. Uh, and as I just read, there, there are just consequences for that in God's law. Uh, but slavery in and of itself, slavery uh, in Paul's day and even back to the Old Testament time, as we have commands for it in God's law, it was just a part of the culture. It was just a, a normal part of the culture. Uh, they didn't live in the same kind of culture we live in today where there's just an abundance of everything amongst us. And the majority of the time, people would enter into slavery voluntarily just so that they would be able to eat, just so that they would be able to provide for themselves. They would enter in, into it to escape poverty, or at times to pay a debt off, and the times when it wouldn't be voluntarily would be either you were born into it, your parents were a slave, so you were born a slave because they were your parents, or you were a prisoner of war, or something like that. And for those who were slaves, it wasn't uh, like you were just a slave for the rest of your life and there's nothing you could do about it, because you would either be bound to your master for a specific period of time, a certain amount of years, or in other cases, you could have the ability to purchase your freedom uh, from your master. You could purchase it because a slave treated properly in this understanding had the ability to earn wages from their master. Uh, some slaves, in some cases, would even own their own property as slaves. Some slaves would even have their own slaves 
as slaves. And uh, you even see some of that brought about and, and assumed in many of the parables that the Lord Jesus used himself in speaking of the relationship between masters and their servants, uh, which is not talking about a, a master having a hired servant. That is the, in those parables, that is the, the Greek word doulos there. It's talking about a master and his slaves and how he's treating his, his slaves. Uh, for example, where the master would entrust to them large amounts of money to handle and so forth. He would entrust different slaves with a certain amount of talents, and they would use those talents to make more money for their master. He's talking about the relationship between a master and a slave there, not a hired servant and so forth. So, again, this is not uh, American slavery being promoted here. And if anything, though I want to be very clear, this is not the same thing what, whatsoever. It is much more similar to Paul, descri Paul describing to someone how their relationship should be between them and the people they work for, uh, between them and their boss, between them and those who have hired them. Uh, it's much more similar to that than it is to what we know as slavery. Now, again, I'm not saying it's the same thing at all. It's not the same thing. Uh, because unless we have some kind of contract, there is in no way that we are bound to our employers for a specific period of time or that we have to buy our freedom from them. Um, there, you know, in, in most cases, you could just leave a job at, at, the, at the flip of a hat. Um, you, can, you can just walk out. Uh, so it's not the exact same thing, but as it is somewhat more similar to that, we will see as we move forward that this text does have much for us in that regard, even though we are not slaves in that sense today. Uh, seeing that makes it a lot more relevant for us and other things as well that we will unpack. So we've answered what a bond servant is just very clearly. It, it, is, it is a slave. Now, let's answer, let's answer this question. What is the Christian slave to do? How is the Christian slave to conduct themselves? And that's a good question to answer because even though slavery in that time uh, was not, as I said, what we know it to be, it just exclusively if, if someone wants to focus on American slavery and how many were treated in that time, uh, even though it was not, it was still a lower class in society. Uh, you were still a slave bound to your master. And as such, you can understand that apart from proper biblical Christian teaching, that some of the liberating claims, the, the freeing claims of Christianity, uh, could be misconstrued or mis misunderstood into the thinking of, well, hey, I'm saved right now. I'm saved. I've been, I've been set free by Christ. I shouldn't have to be a slave anymore. Right? I can get out of here. I can revolt against my master. I don't have to be here anymore. I've been set free by Christ. Well... It is true that we are set free by Christ Jesus. Uh, that is absolutely true. He has come, Isaiah 61, verse 1, to proclaim liberty to the captives. He has come to do this. But as his people, church, what are we set free from? What, what, what are we set free from? Are, are we set free in Christ Jesus from all forms of headship and control, whether ordained by God or not? Are we set free from all forms of control and headship? Well, if you ask the social justice warrior, they would probably say yes. They would probably agree. But that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Christ calls his people to whatsoever. The Bible teaches that if we have been set free by King Jesus, beloved, we've been set free from sin. We've been set free from sin, praise God, set free from the very thing that will lead us into temporal and eternal destruction. Jesus told the Jews in his day in John 8, 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave, a doulos, to sin. Everyone who practices sin is a slave. They're enslaved to sin. So who's ever practiced sin in here? Ever, yeah. Every, yes. Everybody. That's the point. Everybody. Everyone in God's world, apart from salvation in Christ, is a slave to to sin. Sin is their master. They're bound to it, to do its will, to follow it. Uh, the natural man, the person who is not born again, the person who has not been truly converted, is bound and enslaved to a sinful disposition of heart that always desires to fulfill the passions of their own body and mind. They always want to do what's right in their own eyes, in their own opinion. They always want to follow the traditions of man and what feels good to them instead of what God says and how he says to do it. And here's the thing, brothers and sisters. Sin is a hard master. 
who doesn't let his, his slaves get away that easy. Uh, uh, sin is a hard master who doesn't give his slaves opportunity to work their way out from slavery, to work their way out from him being their master. He doesn't give them an opportunity to gain their freedom from him on their own because uh, this is our very nature. This is who we are. Just as a leopard cannot change their spots, we can't change this either. The only way that we can be set free from this fallen, sinful estate is through Christ. He, he is the only one able to do this and qualified to do this, to set sinners enslaved to sin free from it. He entered into the world and he utterly conquered sin. He was never a slave to it. He utterly ruled it. And thought, word, and deed, tempted in every respect, yet without sin. He ruled sin in everything. And just take his temptation in the wilderness as a, a, a microcosm of this or a small representation of this. He's fasted 40 days and nights. And after two previous temptations of the devil, he takes Jesus, the devil takes Jesus to a very high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Something that we cannot even imagine seeing all at once. Fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he sees the kingdoms of this world and all their glory. And the devil says to him, all these I will give you if you will but fall down and worship me. That's Matthew 4, verse 9. <laughs> Beloved, in our weakened estate, even as born-again Christians, after not eating and drinking for 40 days and 40 nights, I can almost assure you that after seeing what our Lord saw in all the kingdoms of this world and their glory, that you and I would have dropped down in an instance. That we would have dropped down in our weakened estate in an instance. It's just us and Him. Hey, who else would even know? I'm starving. I'm thirsty. I can't do this. Maybe you're thinking, oh no, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that at all. But let's be real. Even as Christians filled with the Spirit of God... You have sinned, you and I both have sinned, and in that sense, fallen down to the devil for a lot less than the kingdoms of this world in their glory. A lot less have we done so for. And church, that's why we're in such constant need of our king. That's why we're in such constant need of the grace of our king Jesus, because he don't do that. He doesn't do that. He's not weak like us. He is, he is utterly and perfectly strong. He is the king. He's the conqueror who only at all times worships and serves the Lord his God, which took him all the way to laying his life down on the cross for his glory and to save all of his people whom he gave him from their sins. That's why he didn't worship the devil, even in that weakened state. He, he utterly is satisfied in the Lord his God and seeking to love neighbor as self in truth. And he did so on the cross to save them from their condemnation and enslavement to sin. And then he rose from the dead, forever defeating sin, to see to it that we are saved to the uttermost, enabled to worship God in spirit and truth. Amen? He saves us from sin utterly and completely, which is why he said further in John 8 to those Jews, after he speaks of being enslaved to sin, he says, but if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Not you might be free. Hopefully. If the Son sets you free, if you're truly set free by Him, you will be free indeed. Free from sin. Free from its condemnation before God. And ultimately free from its power over your life as He sanctifies you by His power in Christ Jesus and, and the Spirit of God and conforms you more and more into His image in accordance with His Word. Free from sin. To truly serve our God and Creator in Christ Jesus the way we ought to is his image bearers in righteousness and in truth instead of wickedness and opinion, mere foolish opinion. So, beloved, we're not, we're not just set free by Christ to do whatever. We're set free by Christ from the enslavement to sin to joyfully become slaves of his. We're, we're set free from enslavement to sin to joyfully become his, his slave, to become a slave of God. That's why the Apostle Paul, elsewhere in Romans 1, verse 1, calls himself a slave of Christ Jesus, a doulos of Christ Jesus. And why he explicitly teaches this in Romans 6, that if we have been set free from our enslavement to sin, then in Christ we have become slaves of righteousness. 
Romans 6, verse 18. For a slave of righteousness, if you're in Christ, truly set free by the Son, you are as sla- you're enslaved now to do righteousness instead of sin. And then a few verses later, he says that we're slaves of God. That's Romans 6, verse 22. We're slaves of God now. We're not a slave to our opinion. We're not a slave to foolishness. We're a slave of God and of righteousness. Church, that's what we are as Christians. That, that's just indicatively, that, that's just what we are. As new creatures in Christ Jesus, we are slaves of God and Him and thus slaves to righteousness in every aspect of our lives. In every aspect of our lives. And in having that understanding, having that foundation, you can rightly understand why the apostle doesn't say that the Christian slave is to just get up and get on out of there. Hey, you're free in Christ. Get out of there now. Revolt against your master. You've been set free. Get out of there. What are you doing? No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say that at all. What he essentially tells them is that they are to serve Christ and glorify him right there where they are. Right there, in the circumstances that he saved them in, right there where they are. They are to serve their earthly master in serving their ultimate master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 1, let all who are under, all who are under a yoke as bondservants, regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be revived. So if you're a slave, you are to show forth what a godly Christian life looks like right there where you are. You are to honor King Jesus right there in your current condition of life, which looks like, in that position, honoring your earthly master, honoring him, serving him. You're, you're to regard him worthy of this. Now, that word worthy uh, there, you're, you're to regard him worthy of all honor. That word worthy is the same word that Paul just used when he quoted the Lord Jesus Uh, when he quoted from the Gospel of Luke, that the laborer deserves his wages, it's the same word as deserves. The very same word in the Greek. And that's what Paul is saying here. That slaves are to regard or consider their masters as deserving of all honor. Uh, Christian slaves are not to get big-headed or have a sense of entitlement because of their newfounded position before God in Christ Jesus. But in having peace with God and being heirs with Christ Jesus, enabled now to love God and truly love neighbor, they are to understand as God's slave that their ultimate master has given them all things needed to joyfully serve him right there where they're at. Right there where they've been saved at in their position as a slave. Thus they are to see their earthly master as one whom the Lord Jesus has sovereignly placed in their life to serve and to witness to for his glory, for his name's sake. Beloved, it's why the apostle says that they are to do this. What does he say at the end of verse 1? So that the name of God and the teaching may not be revived. But if you truly want God's name and the teaching of the faith in Christ to be accurately shown and imaged correctly in your life, this is what is to be done. You're to show how our God and Creator would have his people act and live even in that condition of life that he's ordained for you to be in as a slave. That's why the Apostle Paul says elsewhere in Colossians 3, Colossians 3, verse 22 to 24, bond servants, again, it's slaves. Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Don't do it for them. Do it because you're serving Christ in this, he says. He says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You're serving the Lord Christ is what he says. There in your slavery, there in that condition, in that status of life, you're serving the Lord Christ. You don't have to get out of that to serve the Lord Christ. You serve him right there. Just as we serve him in every aspect of life. So why should you be doing this? You're serving him. You're serving your Lord. It's not about your status. It's not about your, your earth, even your earthly master. It's about Christ. It's about what he's called you to do right then and right there. Now, that doesn't mean that though a Christian slave sh- uh, that doesn't mean though that, that a Christian slave uh, shouldn't become free uh, if they are able. 
Because Paul does speak of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In 1 Corinthians 7 verse 21, he says, Were you a bondservant? Were, were you a slave when you were called or when you were converted? When God called you by his sovereign grace into Christ Jesus and into the faith, were you a slave? He says, don't be concerned about it. Don't be concerned about it. But then he says this, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Yeah, if you can do it, do it. If you can avail yourself of the opportunity, get out of it. So you see the point here, church, the point here is being content in where we are. That's the point. Being content where we are. Serving Christ right, right where we are because ultimately we have all that we'll ever need in Him. To bring it in over into some application for us, church, well, let's say we're in a position in life that's not very comfortable right now. I don't like this. It doesn't feel good to me. Let's say we're in a position in our life financially or materially that we don't want to be in. or Let's say we have a job right now that we really can't stand. Maybe our boss is a jerk. Well, as Paul said, if you can avail yourself of the opportunity to find something better, then do it. If you can avail yourself of that, then do it. But until that opportunity comes, understand this. As a Christian, as a slave of God and righteousness, you have not been called to just go out moping and whining and sinfully grumbling about, grumbling about the position of life your ultimate master, the Lord Jesus Christ, has sovereignly placed you in and would have you joyfully served him in. You haven't been called to mope around and grumble. And why? Christ put you there to joyfully serve him right there, to out of your love for him, obey his commands. Church, true contentment doesn't come from our life circumstances. It comes from truly knowing Christ. That's why... As Paul says that he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. That's why I can joyfully serve him as a slave. And I don't have to come out of that. My circumstances don't have to change. My heart, my perspective needs to change because it's all about him who doesn't change and who is joy forever. So your boss is a jerk, okay? So what? Are you there to serve your boss? You're not. You're not there to serve your boss. He's a jerk. Who cares? So what? You're there to serve Christ. And maybe just using this as an example, maybe your jerk of a boss needs to hear the gospel. Maybe he needs to see what godly, righteous Christian living looks like, modeled out for him. Just maybe. And regardless of his or her attitude, whoever your boss is, regardless, you've been commanded by Jesus to heartily obey them in everything, obviously apart from sin. But you've been commanded, regardless of their attitude, to obey them and to, in doing it, Joyfully serve your master. Whatever you do, work heartily is for the Lord. Know that you're serving the Lord Christ. So brothers and sisters, if this book is true, and it is, then Christian men and Christian women should be the most joy-filled, hardest workers your employer has ever known. They should be. Every day. Because they're not, they're not those that are there to people please. They're not there to, uh, to just you know, earn up the ranks and do whatever they need to do regardless. They're there to serve the Lord their God in righteousness right there in the workplace. They're not there to people please. They're not there to serve their feelings. They're there to serve Christ. And regardless of our feelings or circumstances, Christ is always worthy. Amen? Amen. 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 Beloved, I understand day in, day out, I live here too. It can get tough in this fallen world. Day in, day, it can. Very monotonous. But are not the Lord's mercies new every morning? They are. We need to ask ourselves, as this people, church, are we availing ourselves of that every day? Are we availing ourselves of that every day? Are we waking up in the morning with the mindset that what I am doing today, though it may seem as nothing to some, it is very important in the sight of my master? Am I waking up with that understanding, placing that upon my mind, it doesn't matter what other people think. It's a matter, it matters what my Lord thinks. It matters how I'm serving my Lord in this. And am I waking up and asking Him for His grace in the day so that I, I keep that upon my mind, so that the name of God and His teaching wouldn't be reviled because I care more about His name's sake and His reputation and His glory than my own, and my feelings. What are we doing, brothers and sisters? Church, you should never... Have someone revile a Christian at the workplace or really anyone else or anywhere else for that matter.
Okay, well, this could be brought over into every aspect of life. But as, as we're talking here about uh, slavery and then bringing that into application for us in the workplace, you should never have someone revile a Christian at the workplace for grumbling or being lazy or not being reliable. That is, that is not to be for the one who is a slave of God and a slave of righteousness. And if you do have that, it just shows that they are sinfully not obeying this command from their master, Jesus Christ. They are not regarding their earthly masters as worthy of all honor. That's a command. Regard your earth. Jesus Christ, your Lord, the one whom you called upon, commands, regard your earthly master as worthy of all honor. And in not doing so, there needs to be repentance and confession of sin. His, his, his mercies are new, and he has promised to be faithful and just to forgive us of sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness through repentance and confession. That's what there needs to be in this. Because church, this is no light matter. This is no light matter at all. This is about where true joy and contentment is found. This is about proper and right Christian living. And this is about the name of God and his teaching. That's what this is about. These are weighty things right here. So, what is the Christian slave to do? They are to joyfully serve Christ right there where they are. Now, if you have the opportunity to get out, avail yourself of the opportunity. But apart from that, we've been called to joyfully serve Christ right there where we are. The same thing we are all to do here today. And then thirdly and lastly, we'll, we'll answer this question from verse 2. Well, what if our master is a Christian himself? What if I find myself in that position? Right, My master's not an unbeliever. He's actually a brother in Christ. What, what if that is the situation I'm in? And Certainly to go ahead and just apply this to us, you could ask the question, well, what if my boss is a Christian? What if my boss is a Christian? And here this definitely needs to be answered as well because th there's another aspect of sinful thinking that could arise from such a situation as the Christian slave or, or worker with a Christian master could look at that situation and think, well, hey, we're brothers. Hey, we're fam. So he should slack off on me a little bit, you know? He should slack off. Hey, we're family. How are you going to treat me like that? How are you going to order me around like that, like, like you're my boss? Well, he is your boss, but they could think that. How are you going to do that? We're cool. We're in the family together. And in having that mindset, when it doesn't happen, when you don't get treated the way you think you should be treated because you're family, you're going to get upset, you're going to get angry, and then you want to slack off, and you want to be disrespectful, and you want to be irreverent, to the one you've been commanded by King Jesus to regard as worthy of all honor. Sin, sinful thinking, always brings out more sinful thinking. Sinful think, sin always begets more sin. Well, the apostle says to that in verse 2, those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. That just makes sense, right? I mean, it should. It should just make sense. Far from this thinking that, hey, we're brothers, he should slack off on me, the truth is, if you have a Christian master or a Christian boss, you should actually be laboring all the more for them because they're your brother. They're your family. We, we just got through mentioning we're to treat one another as family. How am I to treat older men as fathers, younger men as brothers? You've got a Christian boss. You've got a family member that you're, that you're with to serve with and to honor. We've been called to do good to everyone, Galatians 6.10, and especially to those who are the household of faith. Especially to those who are the household of faith. 1 John 3.16 By this we know love that Christ laid his life down for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. That's just the life of a Christian. Emulating my Lord, imaging him. He laid down his life for me and so I'm going to lay down my life for those whom he laid down his life for in the church. I'm not going to seek my own interest and just live selfishly. I'm going to live for the glory of Christ and his church and his people. I'm going to lay down my life for them for their embitterment. The church... That's not just here when we're gathered together in this building. That's workplace included. That's everywhere included. As Christians, we're those in Christ Jesus who've been called to not seek our own interests, but the interest of others. Especially of those who are fellow believers and beloved in God, just as we profess to be. 
Thus, if we have Christian masters, if we have Christian bosses, that should be seen in us serving all the more for them. Why, beloved, why would we disrespect and not give our absolute utmost for those whom our Lord and Master certainly did when he entered into this world and laid down his life to save them just as he did to us? He gave his all. He entered, he entered into the world and gave what needed to be done for their embitterment and their upbuilding. Why would we not do the same? It's just absolute backwards thinking. Beloved, that's a part of the old man that is to be put off and in Christ renewed as we are to put on the new man in Christ that is formed after the image and likeness of God. It's thinking that needs to be confessed and repented of if it's there. If we have a Christian master, we are to serve them all the more. They're family. I'm there to serve my brother. What a blessing if I get to come and serve my brother at the workplace. Just building from what was said under the last heading, uh, brothers and sisters, not only should we be getting up in the morning with the mindset of pleasing and serving our Lord Christ in the day, but if we have a believing boss, we should also be getting up with the mindset that it's time to go to work and it's time to benefit my brother as well. It's time to benefit my sister as well. It's time to build them up. It's time to go serve the church at the workplace. That is to be the mindset of the Christian who has a Christian master or Christian boss as well. And though it's not in our text, I'll, I'll go ahead and read Colossians 4.1 concerning how Christian masters or bosses are to treat those underneath them. This is very straightforward. Colossians 4.1 Masters, treat your bondservants or your slaves justly and fairly and here it is again, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Right? You're not a master in and of yourself. You're a slave of God in righteousness. Treat those underneath you accordingly. Treat them justly and fairly, knowing that you have a master above in heaven. Very straightforward. Well, brothers and sisters, though we may not ever have someone come up and ask what they are to do if they are a slave and how they are to thus relate to their master, uh, we can certainly see how this relates to our different, different positions really in life, but also as well in the workplace. Uh, but beloved, we've been called to be content in Christ, content right there in our positions in life where he has sovereignly placed us and to serve him in accordance with how he has commanded us to, out of our love for him. Amen? Amen. And as we are not our own, but his slaves bought with a price, by his grace and for his glory, may we do so. And to that end, may he bless the preaching of his word. May he do it. If you bow with me. Uh, King Jesus, our Master, our, our Lord and Savior, may you bless the preaching of your truth. You've, you've set us free through it. Continue to do so as we are sanctified, as we are conformed into your image uh, by your grace and for your glory. Continue to, to sanctify us. Continue to do a great work in our hearts and minds through your word. May we be convicted this morning where need be. May we not be uh, in that. May we not be just uh, uh, hearers only of your word, deceiving ourselves and affirming truth. May we be doers of your word, as you've commanded us elsewhere through, uh, through our brother James. King Jesus, we love you. And those who love you are to obey your commands. May we do so. May we do so. May, 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 may this worship be used as a great means to that end. May we do what needs to be done for your glory, that, that the name of God and the teaching would not be reviled. For you've created us for a purpose. We're not here. We're not just random accidents that banged out of nowhere. We have real purpose. And you are our creator. We've been created by you and for you. May we, by your grace, see to it that we're doing that. Doing what you would have us for your glory. We, we love you. We praise you. We praise you again for your truth. We praise you again for your word. That we don't have to wonder how you're to be served. We don't have to wonder how you're to be worshipped. We don't have to foolishly walk around in opinion any longer. We can walk in truth as you've clearly revealed it to us and given us hearts uh, to, to delight in doing so. We, we love you. We, we bless you. May you bless the rest of our day as we uh, spend time together and go forward to eat and fellowship. May you bless our, our continued worship of you. We love you. We praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.